By the end of this video, your character will be able to move left and right by using the A and D keys, the left and right arrow keys, or even the joystick on a controller if you have one plugged into your computer. Let's get started. Let's make a new folder which will hold our scripts. Go to create folder and name it scripts. We'll then go inside that folder, right click, go to create C sharp script and we'll call this script player movement. Let's go ahead and attach this player movement script to our player. We can do so by clicking on the player and then dragging and dropping this player movement script on. Alternatively, we could click add component and type player movement and then click on it that way. Let's double click the player movement script and go into our code editor. I'm using Visual Studio Code. You may be using Visual Studio Community. Either one is fine. Now, because this video is part of a playlist series that I'm doing on YouTube and it's meant for complete beginners, I'll just briefly explain the anatomy of a C sharp script, but if you already know this, just skip on ahead. C sharp code is contained within something called a class. A class is this bit up here. This is like the parent folder for where all of our code lives. In this case, the code lives in a player movement class. Player movement inherits from something called mono behavior, which contains code and methods that Unity scripts derive from. Don't worry too much about this right now. What you should know is that we write code between these things here with the curly brackets where it says void start and void update. By default, any Unity script comes with these two methods, but we can go ahead and write our own. Any code in start will execute once as soon as the program launches. Any code with an update will be continuously called every frame. These are part of built-in methods and there are many others like them. And then we can go ahead and create brand new methods of our own that we would call whenever we want them to run, like private void foo. For this movement script, we don't need start, so we're just going to go ahead and delete this. We are then going to go here and declare our first variable. This is going to be called public float speed. And by default, it will have a value of zero, but we can change that by just saying equals five. And with float variables, we have to write the letter F after them. Then we end our line by writing a semicolon. We're going to hit enter, go down a line and declare a new variable. For this one, we're going to write the word private. Then we're going to write vector two, and we're going to call this movement. A vector two variable is one that contains both an X and a Y value. This is ideal for a 2D game. If this was a 3D game, then you guessed it, we could instead make a vector 3. But we'll just make a vector 2 variable here. Next, under update, we'll declare a new variable and call this float input, and we'll say equals input.getAxis. And by default, there are two different but very similar options we can pick here, get access or get access raw. For our purposes, we're just going to say get access raw, open parentheses, and then we're going to type within quotation marks horizontal. Now, let me explain what this is actually doing, and I'm going to write some comments. Comment time! What input.getAxis and .getAxis raw are doing is looking at a form of manual input, such as pressing the A and D buttons on a keyboard, or even the left and right arrow buttons on a keyboard, and converting those input values to numerical numbers between minus one and positive one. The difference is that get access raw converts it to exactly minus one or positive one. This is useful if you're doing something like trying to make a character move and start and stop instantaneously. Input.getAxis, on the other hand, converts these input values to any decimal number between minus one and positive one. This is useful if you're trying to do something like make a car accelerate where moving instantaneously between a start and a stop would be unrealistic. Is the parking brake on? Furthermore, input.getAxis and .getAxisRaw are also mapped to look at input conditions on any controller that you have connected to your computer. This means that we can already make our character move with the joystick if we happen to have a controller plugged into our computer. Now, let's assign our input value to the movement variable. In order to do this, we can say movement equals input. However, if we were to only type that and put a semicolon at the end, it wouldn't work. We would have to type input 
times speed times something called time dot delta time, which is going to make this frame rate independent. Basically, it's something we have to use whenever dealing with movement to ensure that we have a consistent movement experience, regardless of how fast or how slow our computer is. And the reason it's still not going to work is because, as I said, movement actually contains two variables. It contains an X and a Y value. Because we want our player to move horizontally, we only want movement to relate to the X or the horizontal value. So we're going to go here after movement and type dot X. And just like that, the squiggly line disappears. Now we're getting our input, multiplying it by your speed, and multiplying it by the value that's going to make this frame rate independent, meaning the movement should behave the same regardless of how fast or slow your computer is. Then to finally apply this movement, we're going to say transform.translate and then open parentheses and we're going to type movement meaning this movement variable. Then we're going to go to file and save, or you can hit control S and we're going to go back to unity. If we go back and hit play, we can test our movement and we can see it works. Although there is an issue that we fall immediately through the floor. This is a leftover from the last video when we, instead of scaling our ground up, we tiled it instead using the sprite renderer. To fix this, we can go to the scene view, look at our floor. And if we go minimize the sprite renderer, open the box collider and edit its collider, we can see that its collider is actually very small. It's really only 1.06 by 1.06. We can change this by clicking these dots here at the end and just dragging the collider up to match the size of the tiled floor. However, an even better way is just to check this box here that says auto tiling, which means that now we can't edit the box collider directly. However, its size will automatically adjust based on the size of the tiling on the sprite renderer rather than the scaling itself of the game object. Then we can go back to the game, hit play, and see that now we can indeed move from left to right using the A and D keys or arrow keys. Of course, we can also move off the screen, but we'll tackle that in the next video.